Welcome once again to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. And let's move to the uh, papers this morning and see what major stories we can share with you. We're starting this morning with the Nigerian Tribune and seeing uh, what the big ones uh, are there. The big one on the screen there says, Why there won't be a national conference? And that's from the presidency. Rebels kill Chadian president. Son takes over. Death has created... A vacuum in war against Boko Haram and ISWAP, and that's from President Muhammad Buhari. Also, NDLEA arrests undergraduate boyfriend for selling drugged cookies to school children. Local government polls, Oyo approves 279.5 million naira to, uh, to print 2.6 million ballot papers. And also, 2023 elections, 10 likely landmines. Judiciary Walkers Strike, Passan Juson meeting with federal government deadlocked. And a few others this morning. Jegede loses to Akira Dulu at tribunal. Alleged assault. Senate to investigate CCT chairman. And uh, we can also find the elimination of bandits and collaborators will help actualize safe schools. That's from uh, El Rufai. Um, we can also see here asylum to IPOB members. UK disrespectful sabotaging terrorism fight, uh, says the federal government. Those are the big ones on the Nigerian Tribune this morning. Let's turn now to the next newspaper, The Nation. The headline reads, experts on stable Chad will worsen Nigeria's insecurity. And they say, Derby's death has created a vacuum in Boko Haram battle. That's according to President Muhammad Buhari. And Uzodima and Fayemi is explaining why insecurity persists. Presidency rules out national conference. El Rufai here speaking says girls have higher kidnap value and gives tips on ending the menace. Tribunal dismisses Jagede's flawed case. Insecurity can consume Southeast, Umahi warns. Why UK may consider asylum for IPOB and massive members. And uh, government targets $504 billion goods in AFCFTA deals. Other stories here on the front page of the Nation newspaper. Chavane convicted of murder in Floyd case. OAE students commit suicide. Government fears COVID-19 vaccine supply delay. And INEC to restart voter registration. Stories there on the Nation. All right. Moving on to the Punch newspapers this morning. Federal government may summon British envoy and Ohaneze Afenifere back UK. UK plans amnesty for persecuted IPOB and Masab members, says the Home Office. An asylum plans disrespectful to Nigeria. It's sabotage, says Lai Mohammed. I would love to speak about that. Also this morning, revenue shortfall experts ask government to cut spending, addressing security. Petrol landing costs hits 216 naira. Daily subsidy now 4.64 billion naira. And also, federal government in Juson meeting ends in stalemate, workers stage walkout. We can also see here, PDP plans appeal as Ondo Tribunal declares a Kiridulu poll winner. CCT chair faces Senate probe of uh, assault on guard. And ritualist murder a man and, uh, six days to his wedding, collect ransom, dismember victim. Air power, ground troops and others needed to wipe out bandits says El Rufai. Um, and we can also see here, uh, Amotekun frees Ekiti Monarch, arrests, kidnap, kingpin. Those are the ones we're taking on the punch this morning. And uh, lastly, let's look at The Guardian. The death of Idris Derby of Chad is a big story still. He says, Derby's death deals huge blow to fighting insurgency, uh, according to President Muhammad Buhari. Presidency forecloses wooing secessionist and fresh national conference. Senate divided as livestock bill scales second reading. World on verge of tragic climate as temperature rise continues. Gumbi bans hunting as 24 die in Waja Jesu war. How government denies self of 5.26 trillion naira uh, tax revenue. Uh, in addition to some others here on the Guardian newspaper. All right, uh, Femi Lawson, once again, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. All right, there's a lot of very interesting stories. Uh, where would you like to kick off from? Well, I think uh, I would like to kick off from the death of uh, 
Chadian president. And uh, of course, the implication on, of course, our own uh, ongoing war against the uh, insurgency, particularly in the northeast part of Nigeria. If you look at uh, the role that Chad has played under uh, the, the debate presidency, you realize that uh, there may be some setbacks from for the war against Boko Haram in the you know in that axis of the Lake Chad. I think uh, that should be of serious concern to Nigeria, and I think uh, Nigeria should begin to look at the war on Boko Haram beyond you know what it's currently it is currently configured to look like like an internal insurgency okay all right um there's also something very big that's all over the news this morning and that is the conversation on asylum for ipob and masab uh, members the nigerian government calls it insulting uh, from the uk government and says it's uh, going to derail the fight against uh, terror here in nigeria do you agree with uh, minister for information lai mohammed See, I, I want to really disagree with the, the position of the Nigerian government, especially when you look at how quick this government is always at in responding to issues that have to do with IPOB and some other you know, organizations that it feels are opposed to this incumbent administration. It is within the sovereign authority of the United Kingdom to classify, you know, citizens from anywhere in the world and so grant whatever status they so desire it is not within the power of nigeria government then secondly if you look at how swift like i said the government responds to issue of ipob then you begin to ask yourself where this minister you know is whenever nigerians or the international committees are raising issues about the atrocities being perpetrated you know, by headmen militia, you know, in, you know, and those it has continuously called bandits, even though they are terrorists. You know, how swift has our government always been in responding to issues concerning them? No, a lot of times you find it taking this government three, four days, sometimes more than a week, to respond to atrocities that are committed, you know, by these criminals that they are calling bandits. But when it comes to do with IPOB, or every other organization, which are in most cases, you know, carry their, their activities in globally recognized, you know, civil manner. This government is always, you know, quick to respond and always, you know, taking it up as if, you know, citizens do not have right to exist under any association. Mm. All right, right. Miss, Mr. Larson. Yeah. A big story we've seen across all newspapers this morning is that the presidency has been ruling out the possibility of a national conference. Remember that back in 2014, about 500 you know, Nigerians came together and they had just finished five months of deliberations. They produced a report of over 10,000 pages, you know, making suggestions about the state of the nation, our political unity and structure, and uh, submitted that to President, uh, the then President, Goodluck Jonathan, who promised to implement them. Many years later, it's uh, you know, almost time for the 2023 elections, we're seeing you know, pro-conference agitators saying we need to convene another national conference. But the presidency here is insisting that's not going to happen and that they should take their grievances to the floor of the National Assembly. Your thoughts on that, please? You see, it is only those who have not taken their time to read the recommendations of the 2014 National Conference that are going to be agitating for a new national conference, especially at this time, where even the report of that conference has not even been viewed, talk less of being implemented by the incumbent administration. And beyond that, the incumbent administration has never hidden, you know, the fact that it is not interested in any discussion as far as moving Nigeria is concerned. Because anytime you raise issues concerning even their own electoral promises, they are always quick you know, to dissociate themselves from it. So for anybody expecting that this administration will conduct a national conference, I think they are not uh, being sincere. And I also want to state that we don't even need any national conference for now if we can, as a country, be serious enough to look at the reports. of. The, I have taken time to read this report. 
And I can tell you that it is the way to go for us to get this country right, at least to a reasonable extent. And you see, this government, not only is it saying it's not going to con convey another conference, that's because it believes there's an existing report. But like I said, the government is not willing to engage people, even though it promised when coming on board that it was going to you know, engage citizens, promise to restructure this country. Most of the promises of this administration were already catered for in that you know, conference report. Okay. But because the government is not willing and is not ready to go the route of fulfilling those promises, the government will never talk about any national conference. Okay. So on the Nigerian Tribune, there's a story there that reads 2023 elections, 10 likely landmines. It's a publication by the Tribune. And, you know, when I went through it, I saw, you know, the author basically talking about all the challenges facing the country right now and how that might, you know, greatly affect the 2023 elections. They talked about the annex voter registration, e-voting system. They talked about, you know, e electoral malpractice. They talked about violence, you know, in elections and all of that. You know, from your, uh, you know, perspective, with all the elections we've had in the country, what lessons really have we learned? Well, as a I don't think we have learned any serious lessons from the mistakes of our elections in the past. And let me tell you, I read that report you are just referring to now. And I want to say that the biggest threat that I see is, of course, the current state of the nation, which has made a, con a country become so insecure like it has never been before irrespective of the reform that INEC may be embarking upon, irrespective of the readiness of the country to adopt you know, procedures like the electronic voting system, you know, even if we start voters registration ahead of the election today, the truth is that it is only under a secure atmosphere that you can have a free and fair election. The current situation in the country does not suggest that we can have any election that will be free and fair in most part of the country. If you look at it today from Sokoto to Zamfara, to Kaduna, to, you know, to, to, to other parts of the north, go from there to Adamawa, Yobe, you know, uh, Borono, come to Bauchi, cross to the other side, going to the east. In Nebuhan yesterday, you saw the governor lamenting. In Nabia the other day, the zona headquarters of the police was attacked. In Nemo, you know, there was... So, is it under that kind of atmosphere that you want to engage harmless, you know, INEC officials and um, unharmed policemen to conduct election? I don't think uh, it's going to be feasible. So the challenges of insecurity is a major, you know, threat. And I think before we start looking at the 2023 election in all sincerity, we should begin to look at the need to address, you know, some of the national emergencies on our hand. And that's why we have continued to, you know, to say that the, this government begin to engage the citizens and told the parts of the demands and aspirations of the people and possibly take the bold step of restructuring this country. That election may be another charade and may be worse than what we have witnessed All in right. the past. Mr. Lawson, uh, I also want you to quickly speak on... Well, good thing the month of April is Sexual um, Assault Awareness Month, uh, but uh, let's also talk about assault here in Nigeria. If you remember um, Senator Elisha Abu um, and how that case eventually ended, uh, there's conversations now about uh, an investigation into Dan Ladi Umar, the CCT chairman. Uh, it says the Senate will be probing uh, the assault of uh, Dan Ladi Umar on a guard. You know, what, what, what's your thoughts on this and how do you see this turning out? It is not going to be the case of uh, Daladi Umar or the previous one involving a serving member of the Senate itself. That will be the first time you know, that the National Assembly or particularly the Senate will be you know, promising to investigate the conduct of public officials in Nigeria. But the truth is that the Senate or even the government as it is constituted have not developed the gut to punish perpetrators for their offense, especially when they are in government. It is very sad that this country is always quick to punish the ordinary citizens when offenses are committed, but you know, treat with kid, kid, kid gloves. 
you know, offense crimes that are committed by people who ordinarily are supposed to be defenders of the people. You can just imagine somebody who sits in, in, in court as the chairman of a code of conduct, code of conduct, could really conduct himself in such a shameful manner in public. And all the Senate could say is it's constituting you know a probe into it. Why have we left the job of the police? Who is primarily saddled the responsibility of you know, investigating and prosecuting civil offenses like what uh, Justice Dana Dumar committed? That mm -hmm. is the question. You don't need you know a bogus procedure of bringing the Senate to investigate such matters. This should have been simply investigated by the Maikama Division of the Police, not even not even the State Command, and they'll get the, 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 whoever is guilty prosecuted. But here we are waiting on the Almighty National Assembly to take decision on assault, you know, or, or, or a civil crime committed by by a citizen. It's very sad. Okay, Mr. Lawson. How many of those committees are we going to be setting up when people fight in Yaba, Oyibo, or Balinde? Hmm. Mr. Lawson, we're talking here about a situation where somebody in power, you know, allegedly assaulted an honorary citizen and all the, you know, back and forth regarding the case. But here on the Nation newspaper, we see a similar situation in the U.S. It says Chauvin convict convicted of murder in Floyd case. We know how the U.S., you know, you know, you know, got agitated with the, with the Black Lives Matter movement, justice for Judge Floyd, where, you know, Derek Chauvin, that police officer in Minneapolis, you know, knelt down on the neck of Judge Floyd, you know, causing him to, you know, uh, to die afterwards, you know, because he had, you know, lost breath. And uh, the, the judge, the judges yesterday, the jury ruled that Chauvin was guilty of the murder. They had sentenced him and he, was, he faces up to 40 years in prison for second degree murder, up to 25 years, third degree murder, up to 10 years uh, in prison for second degree murder. We see his family celebrating and saying this is a day of victory, it's a day of relief. But how do you react to this judgment? It's, it's purely, you know, a case of a society that is governed by law. Even before the ruling of, the, of that court, that pattern of jury, you understand that there have been so many public analyses of this. And you, call, you all followed how the, you know, the procedure was even televised. And, all, and none of these procedures were you know were judged on the basis of emotions or merely because you know they are protesters on the street demanding for justice these are this is the judgment arrived at on the basis of existing laws and how it cannot exonerate any citizen whether you are working for government or you are even in government but in our own case you know one big man decide who gets punished or not and that is a real issue and today, a lot of citizens are crying for justice in Nigeria. Government, governments have, have so many times set up panel, you know, on police brutality and all sort of harassment of citizens. But our own society does not punish people. Rather, it promotes and elevates them. Remember the case of Apo 6, the six traders that were eliminated in Abuja. You know, some layers extrajudicially executed. Today, some of the perpetrators of that crime have been promoted into higher ranks in the police. Is that a society? All right. Uh, Femi Lawson, uh, finally, we, we, this morning we're going to be speaking with um, the publicity secretary of uh, Nez Ndigbo. But I want you to go back to where we started, and that is the story on asylum for IPOB um, and MASOB members. Um, would you describe, you know, the actions of the Nigerian government as enough, you know, for IPOB members to seek asylum are they being persecuted in Nigeria? Uh, do you think that you know they have a case, um, you know, in the international community and in the UK? Well, if you if you see the way this government has engaged every groups that have you know shown resistance to government in this country, at least in the last you know, five to ten years, you understand that the government has not been fair. You know, in his judgment, especially that which led to declaring IPOB as a terrorist organization. This is the same government that have been engaging Boko Haram, rehabilitating, you know, terrorists under the guise of you know promoting national reconciliation and peace. What are, what will really, really have caused Nigerian government to engage members and the leadership of the IPOB 
and the mass up in civil discussions rather than the series of confrontations that we have always seen. Indeed. Even at times when we see these people embarking on peaceful protests televised, just like the same thing is happening to the IMN members in Abuja. Yeah, the states that. roll out tanks and they begin to kill and maim these citizens. And you cannot continue to treat citizens that way and expect that they will not get the kind of you know preferences that is being given to them by the by government like the United Kingdom today. All right. That is just it. Premier Lawson, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for starting our program with us this morning. And uh, we wish you a beautiful day ahead. Yes, thank you. All right, uh, of course, um, that's how we always kick off the show, talking of the major stories making headlines across Nigeria every morning. We'll take a short break when we come back. What happened on this day, the 21st of April, many, many years ago? I'm going back to the year 2016, and I'm telling you of one of the greatest musicians that ever lived. Yes, and I'm going back to the year 2019 to talk about a dark Easter Sunday. Do stay with us. <laughs> 